Hi there. I'm Felix Clock, and I'm here to show you this really cool tool that I got um, introduced to called Pernosco. This is a tool that takes a program that you're trying to debug and gives you a um, web browsable full history, giving you insight into the behavior of the program over its entire execution. Um, it's basically like a debugger that can travel through time. And I've already given a talk about RR, which is the, uh, which is the uh, tool that this is built on top of, which is also a time traveling debugger, but there's some important differences. So the program I'm gonna be looking at, um, it doesn't matter too much about the source code. We'll see, it, we'll see the source code in a second, but uh, the basic way you use this tool is you first need to get an RR recording. So you, so in this case, I've made a recording of this program. It's called Mr. Both, and I used RR to record its run. Um, here, I already captured the previous recording um, of this this program running using RR record, and I happened to pass numcores equals one because I was investigating something at the time. But that, that's not a necessary thing to use Pronosco. It's just something a detail about what I did here. Um, to try to, I was trying to explore things about the scheduling mechanism um, that I thought might be core dependent. So then the program you want to run, in this case, Mr. Both, and I had a, an input to the program, a file called small corpus. So I fed that into the program. And in this case, I captured the standard output and, and I sent it to this thing, this both.log. That doesn't matter too much, except for you to know that the both.log was pretty big. That's the reason why I piped it somewhere else, because it was a big piece of output that I wanted to look at separately. I ran it. Um, it ran for a while, and then I hit Control C to stop it running, and then I used RRLS to see the various um, recordings I had of Mr. Both. In particular, there were many of them <laughs> over time, and in the end, I found out okay, the most recent one was number 29. So then, the important thing is I used a script called Pernosco submit to upload my recording. So I gave Pernosco the, um, the path to that recording, and I gave it a root directory that, so the way Pernosco works is it's actually going to upload the source code um, that you want it to be able to have access to, and so it takes an additional path that represents um, an upper bound, the, the roots, it, multi, it can be multiple paths, it's the roots of uh, where it's allowed to look, because if you have source code that you don't want to share with the Panorisco system, then you have a way of hiding it by just not including it in the set of things that this can trace through. In my case, all the code I'm working on is open source, and so I decided to give it the root directory. It doesn't actually scan my entire file system response to this, it just tells it, okay, you, I'm giving you access to my entire file system in your search for files relevant to this program. And so it did, in response to that command, um, Pernosco submit took a few moments to um, run RR pack to pack the RR trace, um, which is a recording of the run, into something that can be shared portably because RR by default uh, excludes certain things from its traces that it believes it can recover from the local file system. But if you're sharing something to somewhere else, you need to pack it all together into one package. So um, the script automatically, the submit, Pernosco submit script only handles all this. It went ahead and packed the stuff into one big trace um, that's that's redistributable. It went and searched for the source files that it might want to upload, and then it went ahead and compressed it and uploaded it. And with that, once it was uploaded, um, then I had to wait some period of time. So you can see the time clock here was, this was like, uh, I guess, uh, 10 o'clock at night, and so this didn't take too long to run. This is a matter of seconds that this thing ran for. But then I had to wait a few minutes um, to get my response from Pernosco itself that says, here, here's your email. I've emailed you. I processed this thing. And in fact, you can now go to this link to see it. And here is the Pernosco interface to the codes. So this is the full trace that ran. In particular, um, I wanted to point out a few things here. The standard out and standard error was part of the trace that it captured because that's the way RR works is it captures all of the behavior of your program, including the outputs to standard out and standard error. And so when you pass this trace up to Pernosco, it is able to reconstruct standard out and standard error. And what, in essence, what Pernosco has done is actually it's captured the entire execution of the program. So I can scroll up and see all of the events that happened 
in terms of the full computation. By default, it doesn't actually try to show it, load it all into your web browser because it might be a lot of data to send over the wire to the web browser, but you can use more to scroll back, back, back. And the one thing about the interface here you might notice is that there's two buttons, more from above and more from below. So hitting more from below means I want you to keep working your way backwards through the history from where I am right now. More from above means uh, jump to back to the beginning. Start at the beginning and work from there. So you can see that we're able to jump instantaneously back to the beginning of this log file and then start scrolling down. And if I scroll down far enough, I'm pretty sure I'll reach a point where it's going to have um, to show me well, maybe I'm wrong. Actually, this log file may not be that long. I was theorizing that I would hit a point where the more um, would be opened up again. But this log file, oh, nope, there it is. I saw it. I saw it. I don't know if you saw it. Yep. Okay, so this is, you can scroll back and forth and see that there's a place where you can try to fill in more of the history. Okay, but, you know, showing you a log file isn't that interesting. Here's what is interesting. This program stopped because I hit Control C, and it tells us this. We have the fatal signal, um, the interrupt signal delivered to that thread, and we have a stack trace of where we were at that time, but, and we have we have the correlation of where this is and where we are in the source code over here. We can work our way up the stack by sk skimming up here and then maybe looking for where we were in Mr. Bolt itself, and it jumps over here um, in our source code listing so we can see where that was. But here's something that most debuggers don't let you do. We can scroll back through our standard on standard error and click in here, and it takes me to where I was in the code when that line was emitted. And then I can look at this and say, oh, look, that's where this piece of output was produced. And you can go ahead and skim the stack at that point. We can we can see this is, this is at this point in read chunks, um, and we can go up and down the stack as you might expect to see where that happened. And we can then go and scroll around in the standard, the standard out, standard error execution and see more places in the output. And this jumps instantaneously to wherever it was in the source code. Another thing we can do is you can click on a particular line and it'll show you in the window down here, after you click there, all the places where that line was executed in the program's history. And so you can jump back in time oriented around that specific line. So obviously this doesn't change over here when we did that. Uh, like I'm just going to the same place in the source code every time I click this, but you might notice the standard out and standard error is changing as we work our way backwards in time. So all of these pieces of our view into the running application are being kept in sync with each other as we, tr as we scroll around and explore the space. There's also the ability to see a lot of other tools. Um, there's a toolbox up here that, for example, you can, see, you can see the running processes, all the running processes. There's one process here and the threads on it. So we can jump between different threads in the system and see how they were behaving at those points in time. Um, so for example, when we were emitting this line standard out, standard error, this thread down here was doing an epoll wait. Um, and so we can you know, be jumping around that way the last thing I want to show you in the toolbox is, because I'm still exploring all this myself, but there's the full instruction stream of all the instructions that were executed. And that is something we can still traverse as a full history ourselves. We can click here and we can see exactly where we were in the code at this point in the instruction stream and also exactly where we were in standard out and standard error at this point in the instruction stream. You'll notice now it's highlighting individual um, letters or sp points in, in this instruction st stream in response to that. And in fact, you can see it goes so far as to let you say, you know what, for this letter E here, I'd like to know what the data flow was for how that um, letter got there. So there's a data flow tool down here that you can use to say, oops, no, not that. Or if you want to learn how that letter E got there, it's got. It's going to trace backwards through the through the um, data flow of the program. Now, this doesn't necessarily work as well as I would hope, in part because um, Rust's debug info is not as high quality as we would like it to be. There's so there's some open problems that we need to solve before all these tools are going to operate as well as we would like them to. But this is still incredibly um, useful in terms of exploring the program state. 
particular, my particular program here that I was debugging, the issue was that it was some sort of deadlock, I suspected, because the output ended much sooner than I expected to, and pretty consistently ended with um, something with a Vont client set. And so there was something where it would have managed to emit this line, and then something would happen while executing this next line that would go wrong. And so as I mentioned before, we have the full number of executions of that line here, so we can see how it behaved you know, in the past. But also we can look at the most recent execution and say, okay, I wanna see all the instructions that were executed here. And we can actually even scroll all the way to the bottom because this is where uh, this thing, if we scroll all the way to the bottom, as in by, by hitting the more up button at the bottom of that screen that I showed you, if you don't remember what the interface was like for that, it's that whole thing with the more from above and more from below. So what I did was I hit more from below and that what that did is send me to the very end of the instruction stream for the console subscriber. And hitting that lets us actually, and then we can click backwards at each of these individual instructions and explore where we were in the source code. And once we are at this point where we say this thing was at this line, this is the most recent thing that was ex being executed at the time when we hit control C, you can even go ahead and look at the call stack at that point. Now, this is something that most debuggers let you do in terms of choosing the different threads and exploring their call stacks. But being able to jump around in the instruction stream is a different story um, in, in terms of being able to work backwards that way. Now, this particular bug, I happened to figure it out, figure out what was going wrong without needing to explore too much of the history. Uh, so I'm not going to get into the details of what the, this particular bug was, but I think the tool, the exploration is the important thing I want to show you here in terms of just this ability to just immediately jump around in the history and instantaneously see what the program state was at that point. One last thing about the Pronosco interface that I want to um, point out that I forgot to mention already. In addition to be able to jump around in time by clicking in the instruction stream, another thing you can do you have a call stack, and most um, debuggers let you traverse the call stack um, by various commands where you want to tell it what current stack frame you want to look at. But uh, the beauty of a time traveling debugger is that, in addition to being able to jump around in the current point in time and being able to say, I want to go up this stack frame in order to inspect what the, what the program counter is at the current point in time, right? This is like a, a view of the whole stack at one point in time. This is all the same point in time. It's just that we're reviewing, observing the context in which um, all of these calls occurred. But in addition to that, there's something new that this system has that most debuggers don't. These arrows over here. And what are these? These give us immediate access to the beginning and end of the each of those executions of the code on that stack frame. So if you're skim skimming around your stack here, and you say, oh, you know what? I want to know what was happening uh, at the very beginning of this call to poll. You can just click this, and it'll go to the beginning of that call to poll. And that'll now be the top of the stack, right? And you can likewise hit this to go to the end of the call to poll. And we like are now at that point. And RR already lets you do things in terms of stepping, like stepping up and sitting down and, and um, setting breakpoints to stop at certain points. But this kind of fine grain control over stopping relative to a specific point, a specific frame in your stack, I don't know if RR itself lets you express that too readily um, in the GDB interface that it provides. So this is this is something that's new to me. And it was very useful in terms of just exploring these different threads and getting a high level view of where where they were um, because you just go to main and say, I wanna to go to the end of main and hit that hit the uh, arrow for that. Or you can go, I wanna start at the beginning of main and hit the arrow for that. Oh, main's a bad example because main and rust is a funny thing. Uh, so that wasn't that wasn't a good example. The uh, pro more appropriate example would be uh, something like uh, Tokyo main down below. So this main is the real main you wanna be talking about. So I can hit the beginning there to go to the beginning of that or I can go to the end to see the, the last point it was executing. Now, as we know, this program that I'm describing didn't actually finish running. So when I hit the end arrow, it's not going to jump to the end of main. It's just going to jump to what the, la the, uh, the, the, the how far it got in that execution of that stack frame. So uh, it's not quite the end of the function. It's just how far did it get in the history that we ran as we ran it. Still, the point is this is, this is a pretty powerful way to just explore points in time and jump quickly to places that you think might be of interest. 
And once you're there, uh, you can then say, OK, where am I in the instruction stream? Uh, clicking here, for example. And does this get us there? Maybe I'm wrong. See, I'm still, pl I'm still learning this interface. I guess if I click here and then, yeah, now we're at that point in the instruction stream. That's right. OK, yeah, because the, I guess the end point didn't exist, didn't reach the end. So it, it took me to as far as it could. But And then, like, I, I don't know. I don't know the exact model here. But the point is I was able to get to this line and go back in the history and likewise travel here um, and see where I am in the instruction stream by jumping back quickly. My understanding is Pronosco has a lot of other neat tools that I am not familiar with, so I can't explain all of them. I'm not an expert in this tool. I wanted to just show what it's like to play around with it um, as far as it goes. So it's possible there's all other kinds of neat things you can do uh, that I just don't know about yet. But that's that's the demo. All right. Hope to hear. If you, have, if you try this tool out and you find some other neat things, please tell me about it. I want to know. All right. With that, thank you for your time. I hope this has been uh, useful. I hope this has been exciting and that you'll be inspired to go out and try this tool out yourself. Uh, which, speaking of which, this tool, RR is an open source tool, it's free to use, but Pernosco is a service. And so uh, it is not a free service. It is something that uh, you need to pay or set up some sort of you know business arrangement with Pernosco to use. So you can see what their pricing model is over here. The crucial thing is that their business model is that you can use the, you can use it for free for five uploads. So you can go ahead and try it out, see if this thing works for your particular uh, application that you're working on, and see if it seems like it's it could be useful to you. And you can do that. And if you decide it's useful, then you can go ahead and evaluate whether the uh, the pricing model they give you is is you know seems like it fits with what your needs are and whether you think this is enough value for the price. Um, I definitely am heavily, heavily interested in getting this for my own use. Okay, thank you for your time and hope you, this gets you as excited as it got me. Thank you.